Thank you, Bernard. Uh, thank you. Welcome. I would like to welcome, on behalf of the Israel Heart Society, I would like to welcome you again to this meeting. It has been a fantastic tradition, and we are very happy with you, with the, your visit here every year. Uh, the topic of my talk is cardiac implantable ele electronic devices, what we call CIED infections and endocarditis. I'm, I'll talk also about uh, device infections, not only endocarditis. Um, I would like to uh, draw your attention to this document here, which I believe is the best reference ever written on device infections. It's, it's, it is in one of the infectious disease <coughs> journals uh, in 2014. We never read this journal, but this is a fantastic reference. It answers almost any answer, any question that you may have in device infections, including the interventional side. So just in case that you need a good reference, this is it. Uh, the incidence of device infections is increasing. Look at, the, at, the, at this. Can you see me well? No. Um, okay. uh, you can see on, on your right side, uh, on, on the right side you can see in, in uh, uh, the, the blue line is the amount of device interventions, which is increasing. Obviously, we do more ICDs, more CRT, more primary prevention uh, devices. And the higher line is the, is the line of the infections, which is increasing unproportionately to the amount of implants. Because the patients are more, are more, are more sick, we do more upgrades, more replacements. And so the, the increase in the amount of device infections is, about, is more than 300 percent uh, in comparison to the beginning of the decade. If we go into the numbers on your left side, on the left side of the, of the slide, uh, simple um, implantation involves 1 percent infection, uh, replacement involves about 3 percent infe infection, uh, an existing pacemaker without any intervention has a little below 1 percent of infection, and the, the total is becoming two huge numbers. Um, this is a table of the risk factors. It's taken from a, from a sheet that was prepared for the Tyrex envelope. I'm going to get back to the Tyrex envelope at the end of the talk. But this is a kind of a calculation of the risk of your patient to acquire infection during a procedure. And as you can see, the highest risk factors are early intervention. If you have to enter again the pocket, then you have an extremely high uh, risk of infection. The same about treatment with steroids. Um, hemodialysis, chronic renal failure patients, CRT and ICD as compared to pacemakers, replacements as compared to initial implants. All these are, are risk factors for infection. And also I would like to mention to you the fact that if you implant in a patient with fever, you have a much higher uh, chance of acquiring infection. And the same applies to patients with temporary pacemakers. It's very important to try to avoid it we, we make any effort not to implant temporary pacemakers. We even keep patients on isoprel if it's possible, if they are stable, rather than put temporary pacemaker in order to implant them on the following day and not with the temporary pacemaker. This is the bacteriology. I'm not going to spend too much time on this. More than 50% are, are different kind of, of uh, staphylococci. Uh, about half of them are, are staph aureus. The others are a uh, uh, coagulase negative staphylococci. Uh, there are about 10% gram negative in the literature. We have a little more, and various others. Uh, some of the points that I would like to make is that is the in pacemakers there is no real difference between the early and late infections. So the usual teaching that staph aureus is early and staph coagulase negative is late is not really true in pacemakers, and also the so-called one-year cutoff between early uh, between uh, procedure-related infection and chronic infection also does not exist in pacemaker. You can have an uh, implant-related infection after two years from the implant or even later. Uh, some of our own uh, observations are in our in our uh, uh, group we had about 20% of gram-negative rods. Uh, more commonly related to systemic infections, the appropriate antibiotic tr treatment is often, is often delayed because the empiric therapy doesn't cover the gram-negative rod too well. And we also observe the new appearance of a bug called Popionobacterium acne. It's a, it's a skin bug, and we have detected it in several cases. Both these uh, works are going to be presented in this meeting here. 
by one of our students. Um, the presentation may vary. Pocket <laughs> infection is the easiest to, rec to, to identify if there is a, a lead, inf lead infection is actually identified by imaging or by post-operative uh, diagnosis. Endocarditis meaning involvement of the valves. There is a bacteremia or sepsis of an, of, uh, without clear evidence of pocket infection or lead or endocarditis or endocarditis and this sometimes presents a real clinical problem. And there's also this entity what, that I would like to call your attention to is the early post-implantation inflammation. This reference that I mentioned to you all uh, refers to this. And all of us who deal with devices, I don't know how many device people are in this room, but we know this phenomenon of redness, pain, swelling, no fever, no discharge, and it goes away after a while. So there is such an entity, and this group also recognizes this, and you, you try to treat it with antibiotics, and, and it may go away. Uh, I'll get back to this in a minute. Regarding uh, the clinical diagnosis and the additional diagnosis, I think that you already alluded to this. I'll just mention that if you have blood culture, then uh, according to the bug, you can uh, tell the likelihood of the system being, I'm, I'm talking about the situation where the pocket is not infected, no vegetations, and you just have a, 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 a bacterium in the uh, bacteremia. Then if it's a staph orus, you are very likely to have the system infected. About 50% of the cases are infected. If it's a, a coagulase negative or enterococci, it's about 20% to have the system infected. And if it's gram-negative cocci, gram-negative rods, or other, uh, then the likelihood is low, and uh, you can probably treat with antibiotics without considering the system. Um, I would just like to mention one additional point for the diagnosis of endocarditis, which is the use of uh, chest CT, because you can often tell that there are septic emboli. And this may support the diagnosis in doubtful cases. Um, this is the early post-implantation inflammation. We actually uh, looked at it, summarized it, and it's being considered now for publication in Heart Rhythm Journal. What you see are clinical signs of local infection with redness, swelling, local, local warmth, and pain without fever, without fistula, without opening of the pocket, without discharge, without bacteremia. In our experience of 40 patients, 50% of them recovered with oral antibiotics. The other 50 went on to device infection and had to be removed. And again, this, this entity is being recognized by the, by the guidelines of the the British guidelines of the uh, microbiologists, and uh, uh, this is an existing entity. Not everyone is familiar with it. Um, regarding the issue of bacteremia, without, with, without vegetation, without pocket infection, if you have a questionable, sta uh, questionable situation, you don't know what to do with the system, so usually you go by the, by the bacteria that is isolated. If we're dealing, can you see? Is it big enough? No. So I'll, I'll walk you through it. Uh, if it's a staph aureus, if it's a staph aureus, you most likely have to remove the system. Uh, if you don't have an altern clear alternative source of infection, such as phlebitis, often, if it persists over, over 72 hours, if uh, especially if there was a recent operation, you just have to remove the system. If we are dealing with, with coagulase negative stuff or with enterococci, and the TE is negative, as I said, all of them are negative, then you can try empiric treatment for one course. If the bacteria goes away and doesn't come back, then you can leave it like this. Again, we're talking about the situation that you have no signs of endocarditis or, or lead infection. And if we're talking about uh, other grand positive cocci or gram negative rods, uh, they are very liberal, they say just treat it. You don't even have to repeat cultures and, and, and what, because the likelihood that the system is infected is relatively low. The treatment, of course, is based on, the, the treatment is based on, on extraction in almost all cases. The only, the only uh, uh, exclusions are this early post-implantation information that I mentioned to you, and also cases that are too frail or too sick, too sick for extraction, and I'll go back to these cases a little later. 
Uh, lead extraction is not is not an easy game. Uh, let me just th there are several uh, series in the literature, but why don't I present to you our own experience, which goes up to about 500 cases. Uh, most of them were related to infections. Most of them were referred from another from other hospitals. Different kind of leads. Some of them, about 20% were, were removed with laser sheets. 23% were removed femorally, and the other was usually with mechanical sheets. I'll, I'll just look at, I'll just walk you through the, the results. Overall, recently, over the last five years, the success rate of complete removal is above 90%, 94 to 96%. If we go back several years earlier, we would be a little below 90%. There's a certain percent of partial removal, which may be a problem with infectious uh, cases. It's not a problem if you have a pocket infection, but if you are dealing with a systemic infection, our experience, which is also presented at this meeting, that about 16% relapse. If you are not able to remove the system completely, if you leave a tip sometimes or a tail of an of a electrode, and the systemic w and, and the infection was systemic, then you have about 16% of recurrence of infection. Still, I mean, the majority recover even if you leave some pieces inside. Sorry. Complications are the most problematic issue with extraction. Out of about 500 cases, we had uh, six emergency operations. Six emergency operations, four of them terminated in the death of the patient. Three of them were tears of the right atrium, two of them were salvaged, one of them died, and three of them were SVC tears by a laser sheet and all of them died. This is an, a, a, a dreadful situation. SVC tear is, has more than 50% death in the literature. Even if you have the case done in operation room and you're ready to open, by the time that to reach the <coughs> superior vena cava, patient is dead. With one more case that was anesthesia related, but as you as you can see, these are difficult procedures, and this goes back many years. I mean, I, I, I guess that the recent experience is somewhat somewhat better, but I have to warn you that the use of laser sheath <coughs> is probably probably involves somewhat higher SVC tear. So in order to to negate this problem of SVC tear, there are several recent solutions. One of them is this balloon. You leave a wire all the way from the femoral vein all the way to the jugular vein, and you can deploy very quickly a balloon that blocks the SVC completely. And if you diagnose, and it takes a while to diagnose it, but if you diagnose an SVC there, you can push up the balloon, open it in the SVC, and actually close the SVC for bleeding, and you can transfer the patient or open the patient, depending on where you are, and you have about a few minutes of stabilization until the patient deteriorates again. There's also an Israeli, an Israeli startup that uh, developed a kind of a different sheet that doesn't operate on power. All our sheets operate on power against the leads, and this is a, a very special, a very special tool. It is not going to work here. It's a pity because it's nice. I'm oh, sorry. Hmm? Uh, okay, I didn't see it here. I'm sorry. Sorry. There is a delay between this and what you see there. Apologize. I'm going in the wrong direction. <coughs> okay, I don't see it moving. I'm sorry. Uh, so this is a kind of a sheet that walks over the lead like this. It, it's like, it's going like this along the lead. You don't apply any force, you don't touch it. You, re you connect it to the lead, you press a button and the system works forward 
to separate the lead until it gets to the apex. And then it doesn't have any more lead to crawl on, and you can pull it out. <coughs> Theoretically, it may prevent any, any damage. We are waiting for the fa first patient. We have the first in man planned. We, we need special patients with, spe with specific sizes of leads, but we are, we are waiting for the, for the first in man. Uh, this is an Israeli invention. Uh, several physicians and uh, engineers are, are involved. So this may prevent the, the risk of, uh, of, uh, of dirt. Uh, a few other complications of extraction are the extraction-induced tricuspid insufficiency. It occurs in about 15% of the cases in, <coughs> in our experience. Some of them are very severe. As I mentioned to, to uh, Yaron here with the previous discussion, we did not have to take anyone to surgery because of extraction-induced uh, TR, and some of them are very severe, but uh, this is our experience. Uh, we also noted a, a phenomenon of uh, early post-extraction shock. About 10% of the patients that are being extracted for infective, re uh, for infective etiologies have hypo severe hypotension, shock-like picture on the first night after the procedure. It pro it's probably seeding of the infection, maybe some kind of, of toxic phenomena. Uh, usually the patients recover well from the episode, However, it's a marker of, of a worse prognosis over time, probably because it, it, it occurs with a patient with the highest, highest burden of, of infection. But this is a well-known phenomenon to our intensive care people following extraction of infected devices. Uh, once you have completed the extraction, there are several considerations. One of them, which is very relevant, is device still indicated. In about 30% of the cases, we don't re-implant the device could be pa patients who had primary prevention devices that don't want to hear about devices anymore. Could be patients with questionable indication for pacemaker that doesn't want a pacemaker anymore. Could be the, uh, someone who had ICD for 20 years and never got a shock, so you may want to reconsider. Once you decide that the patient needs a new device, especially if the patient is pacemaker dependent, then you have to decide how, how urgent the procedure is, how urgent you have to proceed to reimplantation on one hand, and how safe can you be for implantation, uh, bacteriologically. Then there are some means to bridge until implantation, and there are some technical aspects. So as far as the timing for, for re-implantation, I'm looking at the most urgent cases, which means those who are totally dependent on a temporary pacemaker. What, what could be the earliest time to, to, uh, to re-implant? Uh, we usually consider 72 hours free of bacteremia, uh, preferably one week to 10 days, if you can wait. If it's an endocarditis, we try to wait 14 days. And if it's a tricuspid endocarditis or persistent bacteremia, you probably have to go epicardial, and you cannot reimplant <coughs> transvenously. When a patient needs the temporary pacemaker, this is how it looks like. We put in a permanent pacemaker lead and screw it in, a screw-in permanent pacemaker lead. We extrude it through the skin and we tape a pacemaker to the, to the chest. It's much more stable than uh, the usual temporary pacemaker. You can have it for seven, seven, 10, 14 days. As long as the patient is in bed or in, or in a chair, we don't let them walk around. Uh, we recently summarized our experience presented here 34 cases of this technique over the last two or three years, uh, did well. One of them had recurrent infection on the temporary lead that had to be replaced. No mechanical complications, no dislodgements whatsoever. So this is the way that we go by the period of need for temporary pacing. Um, and if the, if the indication was for ICD and the patient was a secondary prevention case, then we put on a wearable defibrillator until the infection heals and we can re-implant if we decide to re-implant. There is always a question of whether there is role for conservative, totally conservative treatment. And this is taken from an editorial that I wrote for Europace on a, on a paper that related to conservative treatment of infection. I think that it hardly has a role, but sometimes, rarely, 
for, for difficult cases, we can use it. Topaz is a plastic <coughs> surgeon from a hospital in Israel who, who presented 20 cases back in 20, 2012 and now has, I think, 50 cases of local treatment with irrigation for, for a very long time, vacuum and irrigation, and he can get out the majority of the patients without extraction. It is mainly for very old patients, very old, frail patients, and you can, if you can give them one or two years free of infection, it is usually enough. I can tell you that it holds for, for 10 years. And these guidelines that I show you also recognize the possibility to remove just the device, leave the lead in, in cases that are very, very difficult. I'm rushing to the conclusions, I believe. Uh, just a word, going directly to surgery, only for huge, huge, huge medications four centimeters, five centimeters, something like this, or if you need a con concomitant surgery for valves. Otherwise, all cases can be removed transvenously. This is a case of seven, millimeter, uh, seven centimeter vegetation that we took directly to surgery, but usually we can get them out. I mean, don't think of a, of a cannonball that flies into the pulmonary artery. It breaks apart. We hardly had any pulmonary emboli, even with huge veg vegetations, two cases out of 500. So um, <coughs> there's a new guy in town. This is the antibacterial envelope that reduces considerably the amount of infection. Um, just to summarize that the rate of infection is increasing. Extraction is the mainstay of therapy. Only early post-implantation inflammation for extremely frail patients may be considered for conservative treatment, not extraction. Timing of reimplantation, if at all, is determined by the pacemaker dependency and by the extent of the infection. Surgical extraction is rarely needed. An antibacterial envelope may have an important role in prevention. Thank you very much.